the difference between whom to teach and whom not to teach. As the Vinaya Sutra states, do not impart the teachings without being requested to do so. This means that if no one requests it, the Dharma should not be taught. Even when requested, it's important to observe whether the requester is suitable to receive the teachings. If the teacher knows that someone is a suitable recipient, then even if they haven't requested the Dharma, it's still appropriate to expound the Dharma to them. As the King of Samadhi's Sutra states, If someone requests you to impart the teachings, you should first say, My knowledge is quite limited, while you are knowledgeable and wise. How can I explain the teachings to one as great as you? Respond like this and do not impart the teachings casually. This means that when someone requests teachings from us, we should be humble and avoid boasting about ourselves. Before deciding whether to teach, we need to observe whether the requester is suitable to receive the teachings. If you know that the listener is a suitable recipient, you should impart the teachings to them even without a request. Question. Why shouldn't the Dharma be taught without a request? Answer. Teaching the Dharma is meant to benefit the listeners, so it requires them to have faith and reverence towards the Dharma. If the listeners don't request the Dharma, lacking faith and reverence, then even if we impart the Dharma to them, it won't be beneficial. For students, the Dharma is precious and rare. In order to respect the sacred Dharma and receive its benefits, we should request it with reverence. If someone doesn't request the Dharma, but you forcefully impart it to them, they may hear and understand it, but they won't practice it. Later, when they actually need to practice it, they won't be able to absorb it anymore because they think they have already understood it. If they understand but don't engage in actual practice, that's the most terrible situation because it becomes fuel for their ego rather than a motivation for practice. Only when one wants to practice something will they seek to learn it. For example, if you want to practice the method to liberate from samsara, you should request it. If someone doesn't seek liberation, but you forcefully impart them the method of meditating on impurities, they will become annoyed and think, you're talking about disgusting things to me. However, they still hear it. But later, when they actually need to practice it, they won't be able to absorb it anymore, because they had generated aversion when listening to it before. In other words, it can have a negative effect. Therefore, before it's time for someone to learn the Dharma, we should not impart it to them, but keep it confidential. This is why the Dharma should be kept confidential. It's not because we are unwilling to share or because we are jealous, but because when your conditions are not ripe, it's not good for you to know it. Even if you learn it, you won't practice it. And when you really want to practice it later on, you won't be able to absorb it, and the Dharma will be ineffective for you. You should also learn this tip. If someone doesn't request the Dharma, you shouldn't impart it to them. When someone seeks the Dharma, it indicates that they want to practice and deal with their problems. Only at this time should you impart the Dharma to them. This is the best timing. The same applies when we teach the Dharma here. Don't force those who don't seek the Dharma to learn it. Instead, you should share teachings that are suitable for them.
For example, if they don't have the capacity to practice the path to liberation, you can teach them how to be a good person and attain good results. You can share some small capacity teachings which can be applied in their daily lives. When they learn such teachings, they will understand how to eliminate the suffering of illness and disasters and how to become rich. Small capacity teachings can tell them how to gain fame, wealth and promotion. You can first help them understand the teachings for beings of small capacity, enabling them to achieve their goals. This is because at that time they strongly crave these things. If you were to teach them the path to liberation, wouldn't it be in vain? It would be useless. Therefore, for those who are still attached to the small capacity teachings and the path of the human and heavenly realms, don't rush to teach them the path to liberation. If you do, it will only provoke their aversion. This is all due to our ignorance. It's just like taking medicine. If you find that a medicine works for you, thinking that everyone should take the same medicine, then you are too silly. It's because your conditions are ripe, so you feel that the medicine is effective. Your renunciation arises. You realize that you've been wasting your life, and you feel that the medicine is wonderful. At that time, you may even wish for all your family and friends to cultivate renunciation. But this is wrong. It shows that you are ignorant and don't understand others' capacities. If someone doesn't have that capacity, why do you rush? You should practice diligently. After you have cultivated strong renunciation, When you face certain situations without afflictions while others are bound by afflictions, they will find it strange. As practitioners of the path of the human and heavenly realms, they have numerous afflictions, but you are free from afflictions, being content and peaceful. Hence, they will regard you as remarkable and seek guidance from you. At that time, you can teach them how to cultivate renunciation. After cultivating renunciation, one will not be attached to the eight worldly concerns and will experience inner freedom. If someone hasn't suffered enough, they won't seek to cultivate renunciation. So, you should be skillful and observe the listener's capacities. Some people were monastics in their past lives, so they aspire to become monastics from a young age. However, it's still necessary to teach them the three types of suffering and the noble truth of suffering. On the other hand, some people don't have the capacity to practice the path to liberation at all, so there is no need to teach them renunciation. We don't need to waste our efforts on such people. Just give them some teachings for small capacity beings and let them watch by themselves. Don't waste your efforts. If you have time, you can engage in meditation practice. It's futile to impart advanced teachings to such people. Instead, you can just let them watch the teachings for small capacity beings and the teachings of the path of the human and heavenly realms. Don't waste your efforts on them, as it will be futile. It's important to carefully observe the capacities of the listeners. This passage is very important. Those who propagate the Dharma should be able to discern and adapt Don't think, I want to cultivate compassion and equanimity and then impart the same teachings to everyone. Is that equanimity? 
That is not equanimity. You have misunderstood equanimity. Is equanimity like this? Equanimity means imparting different teachings to different beings. This is what equanimity means. For some negative people, you don't even need to interact with them. You should ask them to leave quickly. This is actually practicing equanimity. Why? Because they will disturb you. They approach you because they have other motives towards you. Therefore, if someone with negative motives approaches you, you should quickly ask them to leave. There are indeed people with negative motives. Some come to disrupt the Dharma, and some come to make you break the precepts. In this case, why would you impart Dharma teachings to them? Just give them a string of prayer beads or something else and ask them to leave. You don't even need to give them a collection of the Dharma lectures. However, if you don't give them anything, they won't leave. This is because they are your karmic creditors. You have to give them some gift or food. Just check if there is something to be given around you. I also follow this approach. Sometimes, when someone comes and I have to ask them to leave, I will quickly check if there is something good around me, and then give it to them, asking them to leave. This is not the lack of equanimity. This is great compassion. In order to prevent them from creating a negative karma, we ask them to leave quickly. Some people say that this approach lacks compassion. However, this is not true. We must understand that compassion is accompanied by wisdom. Compassionate people are clear-minded and never act out of indiscriminate sympathy. They treat sentient beings equally, without any emotions or biases. With impartial compassion, we will know how to skillfully help sentient beings. When you truly understand what equanimity and compassion mean, without any emotions or desires for worldly gain, when someone makes generous offerings, you may treat them. When they make offerings to you, they may have some ulterior motives. It's tricky to deal with such situations, so you need to be careful. Sometimes demons come to test you. If you have any desires for fame and gain, or other impure intentions, you will be in trouble. You will quickly be influenced by them. Your emotions will arise, and you won't even notice it. So, female practitioners should be careful. If you have emotions when interacting with anyone, you will be in trouble. If you have wrong views or biases towards others, you will lose compassion and wisdom. In this case, you are too terrible and you should repent. You are not suitable for explaining the Dharma, let alone transmitting it. A Dharma teacher should be very clear-minded, free from biases, and possess equanimity and compassion. Only then can you have skillful means. Since everyone is equal in your eyes, you will naturally treat different people in different ways. It's clearly stated here, you shouldn't impart the Dharma to those who are not qualified. It's wrong to impart the Dharma to them, as that would harm them. In the 50 verses on the Guru, it is stated that if you wish to listen to a teaching, you should request it three times. However, in terms of qualified Dharma vessels, even if they don't make such requests, 
one can still impart teachings to them. There are various explanations for the qualities of a Dharma vessel. In this treatise, a qualified vessel refers to one who can receive and practice all aspects of the stages of the path. Moreover, the Vinaya Sutra states, While standing, do not explain the teachings to one who is seated. While seated, do not explain the teachings to one who is lying down. While you are seated on a low seat, do not explain the teachings to someone on a high seat. Additionally, it is inappropriate for a teacher to use bad seats while listeners use good seats. Do not explain the teachings to someone walking in front while you walk behind. Do not explain the teachings to someone walking on the path while you walk on the edge. Do not explain the teachings to someone whose head is covered or whose upper or lower robe is pulled up, whose upper robe is folded and placed on the shoulder, or whose arms are crossed in front with the hands on the shoulders, or whose hands are clasped behind the neck. This is because such behaviours indicate the lack of reverence. Do not explain the teachings to someone with a top knot, wearing a hat, wearing a tiara, or whose head is wrapped in cloth. Do not explain the teachings to someone riding an elephant or a horse, to someone sitting in a sedan chair or carriage, or to someone wearing shoes or boots. At that time, If someone is sitting in a carriage or riding an elephant, then one should not teach the Dharma to them. Furthermore, do not explain the teachings to someone who carries a weapon. In the Brahma's Net Sutra, Buddhasattva vows, the 46th vow of do not teach the Dharma in an improper manner states, My disciples, You should always teach people with great compassion, whether you are visiting aristocratic patrons or among the general crowd of people. You should not expound the Dharma for lay people while standing, but only while seated on a raised seat in front of them. Bhiksu Dharma teachers should not stand on the ground while expounding the Dharma for the four groups of listeners. During the Dharma lecture, the teacher's raised seat should be decorated with offerings of incense and flowers, and the four groups of listeners should listen from their seats below. One should respect the teacher in the same way one shows filial piety to one's parents, or as the fire-worshipping Brahmins do. If a Dharma lecture is not conducted in the proper way, it constitutes a minor transgression of the precepts. If one imparts the Dharma in an improper manner, one violates the Buddha's art for vows and creates negative karma. Don't think that there is no problem with it. In fact, there are problems. You might think, what is the fault in teaching the Dharma while standing? In fact, teaching the Dharma while standing is improper, creates negative karma and will result in karmic consequences. You might think, it seems fine to teach the Dharma while standing. What negative karma is there? In fact, the underlying karma is quite complex. First, the Dharma protectors are displeased. Moreover, the lay audience won't respect the Dharma. As a result, it will hasten the decline of the Dharma. If none of the above situations applies, then one should impart the Dharma. The premise of the above situations is that the listener is not ill. 
If there are special circumstances, such as the listener is ill, there are corresponding permissions. If the listener is ill, then they may not need to fulfil the requirements mentioned above. For kings who are stubborn and hard to transform, it's allowed to teach them while standing. You can see that Buddhism is very flexible. It doesn't say that it's absolutely forbidden to teach the Dharma while standing. In the case of noble individuals who are resistant to change or in special circumstances, sometimes it's okay to briefly teach the Dharma while standing. This is because the opportunity is rare. If one seizes the opportunity to expound the Dharma, it will be effective. Although there are some minor faults, the merits far outweigh the faults. These permissions are all granted in terms of special time, circumstances and individuals being guided. They are only granted when necessary. We know that precepts can have exceptions, but wisdom is required. Without wisdom, one cannot uphold the precepts. Those without wisdom are rigidly observing the precepts, without understanding the granting of permissions in the different circumstances. Such individuals suffer a lot. They are very ignorant and narrow-minded. Those who cannot flexibly uphold the precepts lack wisdom and are pitiful. Therefore, those who study and uphold the precepts must possess wisdom.